The McMurrick Havna family, who live at Burris House in County Carlow, are descendants of Dermot McMurrah, the King of Leinster, who invited the Normans to Ireland. 150 years ago, a young man from this family set off from Boris House on a journey to India. I shall call him Arthur, although in his day such familiarity from a stranger would have been unthinkable. What made his 5,000 mile journey particularly extraordinary is that this man was born without arms and legs. His arm stumps were just long enough to meet across his chest and his legs came to mid-thigh. Local gossip at the time said his deformity was a result of a peasant's curse placed on his mother, Lady Harriet, for removing two iconic statues from the church. It is more likely it was the consequence of her taking a cocktail of opium and alcohol. This was popular with pregnant women at the time. Arthur was fortunate to be born into one of the wealthiest families in the country. And his mother was a tough cookie. She decided from the beginning that his disadvantage would be his very strength. She employed a special nurse, Anne Fleming, to take care of him. Anne showed him what he could do with his short arm stumps. She would place toys just beyond his reach so that he had to wriggle towards them and she ignored his cries of frustration. With lots of exercise, he became really good at using his arms and could do loads of things, including writing clearly. It is said he grew up full of fun and was the leader of pranks among his friends. He became a fearless horseman, riding in a leather chair saddle with his torso encased in a harness. He rode to hounds with the Carlo Hunt and showed great courage riding his horse Tinker and leaping over ditches and walls at the same pace as any other huntsman. He was also a noted yachtsman, a keen angler, a photographer and a best-selling author. But it was his love of horse riding that took him on his most extraordinary adventures. When he was 15, his mother took him, his brother Tom and their teacher, David Wood, on an 18-month expedition to Egypt. They travelled on horseback from the River Nile across the Sinai Desert to Jerusalem and Beirut. Returning with a collection of more than 300 items now housed in the National Museum in Dublin. According to his diaries, Arthur considered himself something of a ladies' man. And in his early twenties, he formed a relationship with what was considered an undesirable girl. So his mother sent him off on his travels again. And with his brother Tom and the teacher David, they journeyed on horseback for nearly two years through Norway, Russia and Persia, with Arthur strapped into a wicker basket saddle for most of the time. They encountered all kinds of extreme weather conditions, from snowstorms to firestorms. On one occasion, Arthur was immured, delightfully it seems, in a Persian prince's harem where he became dangerously ill and was nursed back to life by an old female slave from Africa. They journeyed on to India, where their travels ended in tragedy, as Tom died of consumption 
and David was killed in an accident. Alone now in India, Arthur got a job as a government dispatch writer. However, when his mother heard about these developments, she sent him money with instructions to come home immediately. On his return, he discovered he was now the squire of Boris, as his surviving brother Charles had died in a fire. By this time, the Great Famine had devastated the countryside. The tenants were hungry and penniless, and the estate was in debt. Arthur quickly took control. Many landlords were simply evicting tenants who couldn't pay the rent, but evictions had never been an option for the Kavnas. Arthur believed passionately in the divine right of landlords to their position in society, but equally he believed in the obligation of landlords to care for their tenants. Finances were low, but he figured much could be done without money. There was plenty of timber on the estate, and he erected a sawmill to give employment and set about building houses for his tenants. Within a short time, the village of Boris, as we see it today, began to take shape. He married his cousin, Frances Mary Lethally, but prior to marrying her, it is said, he brought her father on a tour of the Boris area and pointed out several of his illegitimate children as evidence that his deformity was not genetic. Anyhow, he and his wife had three sons and two daughters, and by all accounts it was a love match, and he became a devoted family man. He helped his wife develop a lace-making cottage industry, and afterwards Boris Lace found its way to wedding ceremonies as far away as Russia. He paid for the railway to come to Boris, spending a fortune on a huge 16-arch granite viaduct that is still to be seen. He was appointed a Justice of the Peace and could be seen daily, seated by a stone mounting block in the courtyard at the house, listening to grievances, giving advice, making up quarrels and even arranging marriages. At 35 years of age, he was elected an MP for Wexford, which allowed him to combine his love of sailing with the business of Parliament. He sailed the Lady Eva, his two-masted schooner from New Ross, across the Irish Sea and up the Thames, where he moored it opposite the Houses of Parliament. A servant rowed him across the river and carried him into the house. He created a, a most favourable impression in Parliament and was regarded as an authority on Irish affairs. But with the rising popularity of land reform through the Land League movement, he could see that property law was swinging against the landlords. And in the elections of 1880, he lost his seat. It was a loss that severely weakened his zest for life. Nine years later, on Christmas Day, the 58-year-old asked that Christmas carols be sung around his bed. Quietly listening to the soft singing, Arthur McMurray Kavna passed away. In an era when disabled people were generally kept out of sight and out of mind, Kavanagh's story is indeed remarkable. But his genius was that he never believed himself to be remotely unusual. <laughs>